In this video, we're going to address the topic of drawing lines. Now, of course, as we're creating navigation networks, it's very helpful to see the connections between nodes. We're going to represent these connections using lines. Now, inside of XNA, we're not given any direct behavior with our sprite batch drawing that allows us to draw lines. So what we're going to do is we're going to put together a simple function that will take in two positions and it will properly orient a very thin rectangle in between those positions to look like a line. Basically, we're going to leverage the fact that any sprite can be rotated. And so we're going to simply use rotation and rectangular sizing to stretch a sprite between two points. And this will give the visual representation of a line. Now, as, we're, as we build this uh, function throughout, these, throughout this video, I'm going to begin with an example scenario. We're going to put together two actors, one of them locked to the screen, one of them locked to the mouse. So we have an example of something that we can draw a line in between, two discrete positions. So we can kick this off here inside of our brand new scene navigation class. And we're going to put together a very simple, though temporary scene for use with our line drawing. Now again, since we're going to be locking to the mouse, I'm going to add an additional using statement to gain access to the types found in XNA input. So I'll simply duplicate one of these lines, giving us access to framework.input. Now, inside of build scene, we're going to simply create two actors. So I will make an actor local variable called actor. Then we can move down and use our actor variable to make some actors. So the first one will be actor is equal to new actor. We need a texture and a color for the actor. So we can begin with the familiar arrow texture. We can pass in style dot arrow texture and a color of color dot white. Now with this actor, let's set up a scenario where one of these actors is locked to the center of the screen and the other actor is following the mouse. Now, for the position, we'll grab our actor and we'll set its position field. Rather than calculate the true center of the screen from graphics device, since this is only a temporary test, I'm just going to assume that it's 800 by 600, giving us a center point of 400 by 300. So we'll make a new vector 2 at position 400 by 300, and that should take care of our first actor. Now at this point, the navigation scene is of course already in place, so we can briefly build and test and see that, yes, we do have our brand new actor in the middle of the scene. So now we need a second actor to lock to the mouse. Now for this actor, we need to be able to maintain a reference to it outside the build scene method. As a matter of fact, every time we enter the update method, we still need to know what actor is getting locked to the mouse so that we can move it appropriately. So what we'll need to do in order to accomplish that is jump out here and create a field. We'll make an actor field. We can call this, for lack of a better term, mouse actor, since it's the one that will get locked to the mouse. Now we're still going to create it inside a build scene, so we'll say that mouse actor is going to be equal to a new actor. Again, passing in our style dot arrow texture and giving a color of white. We won't worry about the position since this will be gathered from the mouse itself. Now, of course, the mouse position is going to change throughout the running of our app, so we need to update it every time we hit the update method. So we'll jump in here inside of update. Now we need to gather a vector-based position from the mouse. To gather that information, we need to gather the state of the mouse. So we'll create a simple mouse, um, excuse me, mouse state. Uh, we'll create this as a local variable inside of update. We can simply call this mouse state and then grab the state of the mouse with a call to mouse dot get state. Now we can turn around with our mouse state. Before I go forward, let me do a brief correction to the spelling of mouse state. Now using mouse state, we can formulate a vector two. With a vector two, we can update mouse actor's position. So let's put all this together in one line. Mouse actor dot position is going to be is going to need to be set to a vector two. So we'll start a new vector two. Now we need x and y coordinates. We'll get the x coordinate from mouse state dot x and the y coordinate from mouse state dot y. 
All right, that will take care of our mouse actor. Now all actors get updated. So now when we run the demo, we see we have a second arrow actor that is indeed locked to the position of the mouse. Now, one other thing I want to adjust with these, I've created them as simple, familiar arrow actors just to progress from the last demonstration. In order to make this a little bit closer to the actual navigation demo, let me switch these over to using the node texture. Even though these aren't, of course, real nodes yet, it will help visually to see why we would want to connect them with lines. So what I'll do is inside of our actor, we'll change it to use style.node texture, and we'll change the color to be style.node color. Now I'll copy this method signature to the constructor used in our second actor. Make sure that both of them are using node texture and node color. So now we can see the circles that are going to be used to indicate nodes. So at this point, we have the test bed to solve our line problem, where we have two actors, and we would like to see a visual line connecting both of these actors. To do this, we're going to begin a class whose job is simply to house a draw line method. We'll actually do this inside of a folder, since there's going to be uh, some different categories or sections we'll need to progress into. We're actually going to consider the line as part of the editor code, since the end result, the output of this entire exercise, will be usable paths by actors, not necessarily something a gamer is going to see. So what we'll do is we'll make a folder here in our behavior demo called editor. Now editor is going to house things like the actual editor that we'll use to place and move nodes, and it's also going to contain any of the auxiliary classes that are needed to make that editor work. Since we're really considering the lines to be an editor's tool so that someone can see a path network, we're going to group the line drawing itself into editor. So into our new editor folder, we're going to add a class, and this class will be called line. So here inside of our new class, the first thing we'll do is we'll clean up the sub namespace since we would like all these to reside in the behavior demo namespace. We need some using statements. So we'll drop in a using for Microsoft.xna.framework as well as framework.graphics. Now for the line class itself, line is going to be a static class. And inside of the line class, we are going to house a single method. This method will be called draw line. Now, as we define it, we want to make sure that it is public, that it is static, and we don't need a return type, so we will set this to void. The name is going to be draw line. And there are a handful of parameters that we need to take in. So we'll address these one by one as we go. The first thing we'll take in is going to be a sprite batch. So we'll call the parameter sprite batch. Of course, this is going to be the sprite batch that will be used to draw the line graphic itself. Moving on from here, we're going to take in a texture 2D. We'll call this texture. Now, the idea is that the line will utilize the fill texture currently inside of style. But in order to make this method more robust and able to stand on its own, we're going to pass it in as a parameter rather than leaving a dependency on the actual style class. All right, moving on, we're going to pass in a color to use when drawing the line. So we'll have a color parameter called color. Now we need the two positions that the line is going to be drawn using. The syntax we'll use here is basically point A to point B. Now, rather than using actual vector points, we're going to make the line class aware of actors. And the reason we're going to do that is because actors have a radius. So we're going to draw a line that connects. If you were to imagine the radius defining a circle around the actor, we'll draw the lines in such a way that they connect the edges of the circle rather than drawing all the way to the centers. In order to gain radius information, we'll need to actually pass in actors rather than individual points. So really the line class is going to be used in conjunction with actors where we pass in an actor to draw from and an actor to draw to. So let's drop the first of these in place as an actor called actor A. 
and a second actor as actor B. All right, one last thing that we use when drawing is going to be the layer depth. We're actually going to utilize layer depth once our debug drawing code gets more complex. So we will pass in a value called float layer, and that will give us access, or rather a means, to pass a layer depth into the line drawing. All right, with that, our method signature is now ready to be used. So we'll block in our two braces for the draw line method, and we can begin with the actual code. Now, while we're taking in actors, we will need vector positions to do our actual drawing and calculations, so we're actually going to copy the position values out of the actors to local variables, primarily just for readability's sake. So we'll make some vector2 variables, beginning with one called point A, and we'll copy the value out of actor A dot position. We'll do the same thing to point, or rather, actor B. We'll make a variable called point B, set to actor B's position. All right, now that we've gathered the actor information, the idea is that we want to be able to calculate a directional rotation using these. So we're actually going to make a direction vector by subtracting the two points. So we'll make a vector 2 called direction, and that will be set to point A minus point B. Now, since we will need to treat this direction vector like a unit vector, we're going to normalize the result, since we did a subtraction which is also going to contain the magnitude, the distance between both of these. So we need to normalize the direction vector 2, but of course before we do that we want to make sure that there is some actual length before we attempt to normalize. So we'll check that using if direction is not equal to vector2.0 then we know that it must have a length and therefore it can be normalized to a unit vector. So if this is the case we simply take direction and call its normalize method. Alright, so we have prepared a direction vector. Now let's move on to, let's see, positioning and drawing the line. There's actually a few topics we need to address since we need to go from the world of a basic rectangle that exists where we draw it to a rectangle that is rotated and stretched between objects. And we'll handle these as two different problems, beginning with the rotation problem. So what we'll do is we'll make another local variable, this time a float, called rotation. And we will use the ATAN2 function to calculate the rotation in radians that this direction vector is indicating. So rotation is going to be equal to math.ATAN2, and we need to pass in the y and x components of the vector in question. So we'll pass in direction.y and direction.x. Now, of course, ATAN2 is going to return a double, so we will cast that to float before storing it in the float variable. All right. Now that we've got rotation value, in order to see this rectangle, we need to establish a rectangle to use when drawing. So let's now move on and create a rectangle. We'll make a rectangle, and we'll simply call this variable rect, and we'll set that to be a new rectangle. So for a rectangle, we need to take the information we've gathered so far, which is a point, so we can easily get x and y coordinates, out of these points. But this brings up an interesting question, and that is exactly where to place the rectangle. Now, to avoid this becoming too much of a compound problem, I'm going to begin by hard coding some values in place. So let's pick some random screen coordinates. How about 100 in x and 100 in y? Now, for a width and height, once again, we haven't gotten into exactly how this line stretches between points, so I'll hard code in a value of 200, and all we have left is height, and we'll set height to be a value of 2. So, so far we have a very, well really we just have a placeholder rectangle that we can use for drawing. Again, the, the purpose of this is so that we can see what's in rotation. 
later we'll adjust the rectangle to contain actual positional information. Now, before we draw the texture, we need to know where the center of the texture itself is. So we're going to make a vector 2 called origin, and we'll set that to be a new texture, or excuse me, vector 2. We need to take this incoming texture 2D and find where its center point is, so we can draw it uh, appropriately centered on the screen. So that means we need to calculate texture dot width divided by 2. For actually, I'll specify that as 2f so we can get full accuracy there. And texture dot height divided by 2f. So with this origin, we're now ready to begin drawing. So we'll make a call to sprite batch dot draw. We'll pass in the texture. We need a rectangle for drawing, so we'll pass in rect. We'll jump down now to the sixth overload of the, actually, let me jump to the uh, fifth, since we're going to be drawing using a rectangle rather than a vector two. So we already have our destination rectangle plugged in as rect. We need, uh, or rather, we're allowed to specify a source rectangle that we won't use, so we'll specify a value of null. For a color, we'll pass in the color parameter. For rotation, we'll use the rotation value we've calculated. For origin, we'll pass in our origin value. For sprite effects, we're not going to use any, so we will specify none. And for layer depth, we'll pass in layer. All right, with all of this in place, we should have part of the functionality that's used in drawing our lines. Now, in order to actually see one in the scene, we're going to jump back over to our scene navigation down to the draw method, and we'll draw a line between our two actors. So what we'll need to do is we'll need to gain access to both of the actors. And thinking about this briefly means we need access to this first actor. We've already got access to mouse actor because he's a field, but our initial actor was defined as a local variable. Just for the purposes of the test, we could move this actor definition out to a field so we have actor as a field and mouse actor as a field. That will make both of them easily accessible here inside of draw. So now we can take a look at our new line class. We can call its draw line method. We'll pass in the sprite batch. The texture to be used here is style.fill texture. The color is going to be style.line color. For our two actors, we can pass in the field's actor and mouse actor, and for now we'll give a layer depth of zero. All right, with all of this in place, let's look here and actor is, ah, our actor field is actually conflicting with the actor used in the actor's loop. So very briefly, we could, let's uh, rename this to actor A. And that will resolve the naming conflict with our actor local variable. Now we should be able to build and run, and we have an interesting scenario. We do have a line being drawn, so we can see up here in the corner we have this line. It's not positioned yet, of course, because we hard-coded its location, we hard-coded its width and its height. But notice what's happening in relation to its rotation. We can seem to rotate it any way we would like based on our two actors. So if we place these two actors to where they are basically horizontal, we get a horizontal line. If we move them so that they're vertical, we get a vertical line. So we are correctly calculating a rotational value based on the position of our two actors. So you can see this is the beginning of placing that line between these two, since he will now rotate so that one actor always points at the other. Now we need to get positional information in place. So over here inside of line, now for our position, we need to calculate the point that is halfway between the first actor, actor A, and actor B. So a point between points A and B. We need to specify this as individual X and Y components, so we'll calculate them individually. I will also adjust the way we're formatting our rectangle, rather the way we're formatting our parameters, so that each parameter will appear on its own line, and this will give us more room to work with as we work with each component. So beginning with x, we need a position in x that's between points a and b. To calculate this, we'll take point a dot x plus 
point B dot X, and we will divide that by two. Now in order to get the correct order of precedence, I'm going to place the first addition calculation in parentheses. So that result gets divided by two. Now before we store this in a rectangle, we of course have to cast this to int in order to satisfy the rectangle itself. So again, just finding a new point between points A and B in X. Now we can copy this calculation, paste it into Y and address point A dot Y and point B dot Y. And somewhere along the way, I picked up an extra comma, so let's pull that back out. So again, point A dot Y plus point B dot Y divided by two. Now, this should take care of position. So if we launch and run the game, we can see that we have our line now correctly positioned between the two actors. Of course, it's not stretching in between them, so we, have, we maintain the line length of 200, but we can see that if we position them roughly where we would want them, that makes a nice line drawing between the actors. So, now let's go ahead and get stretching in place. If we're stretching, we need an actual calculated value to replace this hard-coded value of 200. Now, to calculate the length, initially this is very simple. Since we have points A and B, we can subtract them, find a vector between them, which we are already doing with direction, and we can simply grab that as our length. As a matter of fact, we could actually optimize this a little bit and use this calculation in both cases. We can harvest, you could say, we could harvest the length of direction before we normalize it. So we can make a float called length that is set to direction dot length. And again, in this case, it's very important that this line take place before we normalize, since the direction will have a length of one once we get past this line. So using our length, we should be able to apply this to our rectangle. If we drop length in place, of course, we'll have to cast it over to an int to use it with the rectangle. But now we should have a length that adjusts itself to properly fit the length between the two actors. So this is working very nice, except for one little artifact. And you can see that we're drawing from the centers of these circles. Now to make this look a little bit nicer visually, let's take the radius of each actor and draw from radius to radius so it looks like we're connecting the edges of the circles rather than the centers. Now, in order to make it look like these edges connect, we're simply going to take the points that this line exists at and advance them from the center of their given actor to their edge. And this is an easy calculation because we can simply take the radius and move our vector by that amount. So what we'll do is right after we have calculated the direction, and this is another point where ordering is important because we need to have direction normalized so that we can use the direction with an arbitrary distance. So what we'll do in order to change the line is we'll simply readjust points A and B. So point A is going to be decremented and it's going to take the direction vector and it's going to take direction multiplied by actor a dot radius. And this is why it's important for direction to be a unit vector, is we want to move this many units in this direction. So basically take wherever we're at at point A, but decrement this amount of distance. We want to do something very similar to point B. So we'll take point B, but we will add to it direction times actor B dot radius. So simply move back in in the other direction on the other side. So now if we build and run, we can see that we have the lines not yet moving out, but that's because we are calculating our length afterwards. So we may need to readjust the order in which length gets created. As a matter of fact, we may not be able to use that shortcut. I was looking at that as a hopeful optimization to length, but in this case, readability wins out over optimization. So we'll actually jump in here right before we set up the rotation. We need to use our length. Again, that would have worked fine if we were drawing the lines directly between the points but because we need to offset the points before we draw them, we need the length, the new updated representation of length. So originally we got length by subtracting point A from point B. So we'll do the same thing again and get the length of that. Matter of fact, I'll just wipe out direction here and I'll take 
placing in parentheses, point A minus point B dot length. So we won't even worry about storing that result in a variable since we're only interested in the length of that operation. So now if we run we see that we have a line connecting the two actors but being offset by their radius. So with this now, let me check one final thing. There is one case we could handle if we would want. You notice the moment these go negative, we actually draw the line in the other direction. Now in our case, we're not going to handle that as a case inside of the line. Later in the demonstration, we'll be handling that using layer depth. So we won't worry about the scenario because we're going to set up a system where lines always draw behind actors. So with this now, we have accomplished what we set out to do, and that is create a line drawing utility that will draw an arbitrary line between two actors. And here we're also taking into account the actor radius of each actor. So with that, before we bring this video to a close, I do want to remove the test code since our usage of these actors here was just to demonstrate the use of the line. Since we can see that lines are now working the way we need them to, I'll go here inside of our scene navigation class. We will pull out the two actor fields. We will clean up and remove all of the code from build scene. Inside of update, we will remove the two lines that are used with mouse state and mouse actor. And inside of draw, we will remove the line that is currently drawing our debug line. So with all this, we can build to make sure that nothing was left over. And we are back to the blank scene. So with that, we have successfully built a line drawing utility class, tested it out, and so that will bring this video to a close.